Praise the Lord. You know, <coughs> I just saw a really cool revival. Well, maybe not revival, but kind of like evangelistic outreach that lots of people got or made a profession of faith and, you know, it was hooked up to lots of churches so that they can do their part to participate in it and get people involved so it'd be kind of exciting, you know, to in your own local world and your own local church, you know, have a rebroadcast of a message given evangelistic outreach so people could make the choice to decide to follow Jesus. That's cool. You know, I like that. But you know, a lot of times in those outreaches, though you may get thousands to come forward, you get thousands who are left behind. Meaning that what they do is they make this profession of an emotional kind of like wound up thing. And then by, oh, I don't know, maybe a month later, you can't find them. Fortunately, that's kind of our fault. We need to follow up with what happens when people make emotional choices as opposed to walking in the light as he is in the light. Because you see, when God wants to reveal something, he shines his light on it. He looks at it a little closer. You know, he doesn't let any shadow of hiding something, you know, inside of us be not revealed. And those moments when people really are emotional, they, they really mean it when they say they want to give their life to Jesus. But then a little longer, a little later, you know, kind of when the novelty wears off, it gets tough. As a matter of fact, it gets hard. You know, it gets rough. You know, it's kind of like, you know, getting a cross and having to bear it. You know, to drag that cross of what you need to crucify your flesh on. Because that's what happens to a Christian. They start off with, you know, all the joy of a baby. But sooner or later, they get discouraged because they weren't always told the rest of the story. You know, my wife today, she was kind of really discouraged. You know, really bummed out because having to work in her position, she has to deal with personalities of people that sometimes are really wrong. You know, you know, bad bosses or bad examples of people, you know, that maybe a supervisor or a, a local important person, a VIP that, you know, has gotten too carried away in the way he does things, gets carried away with who his personality is as opposed to the professionalism that could have been used. But that's what business is. Business is business. And so we as Christians have to deal with the world sometimes that way and we have to accept where God has placed us unless God tells us to move on. And sadly, unfortunately, when God does tell us to move on, one of the things he does is he puts in our heart this separation. Some people call it in counseling the alienation of affection where you alienate your feelings from the object of your affection. So you no longer feel connected to that person or that job or that place or that thing. It's the alienating or the drawing away of the perspective of having, oh, you love your job and you like being there. And a lot of times people don't know how to deal with that. You know, they don't realize that sometimes when they're feeling that disassociation with their job, that's God doing it. You know, God is removing your love for your job and placing it somewhere else because he wants you to go somewhere else and to do something else. And unfortunately, that may be what my wife is going through at this time. And she's challenged greatly in her faith. But how about you? Do you think that God is going to bless you? Well, he's not. You see, we're, we're getting towards the end of the world. And if you're getting only blessings, then you're being shuffled off and sidelined. You're really not being used by God. Because whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And if you're not going through trials, you probably are just being set aside because God doesn't want to deal with you anymore. Recognize something that's true about these latter days, and you may recognize the place you need to come to with your relationship with Jesus. Because God is light and in him there is no darkness, he wants to use those that are full of light. He wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit. He wants to cause you to, yes, have peace, love, and joy, and to 
accomplish his will, but that doesn't mean you get to prosper in financial gain or use his name for your own glory. That's not going to happen. Let's be the first one to tell you that. If you have gone out and taken that which God has given you and used it for your own benefit, even in ministry, then though God may use that ministry, he may refuse you. You see, God used a jackass when he could use no other person in the circumstances to warn Balaam of his impending destruction. God spoke through the jackass. Now, a lot of times we think of you know ourselves as being really important because, oh, God used us. So then we get this inflated idea of who we are instead of who he is. And that's where we have to keep in the light. We have to focus our attention on what is important in these latter days. It's not important that you get your ministry together. It's not important that you get your calling. What is important is that you find Jesus in you and that you retain your relationship with God in him according to 1 John so that we would be in him and he in us so that we would have fellowship one with another because it's getting a time where God is willowing out the weeds, the weeds, the wheat from the tares and God is beginning to filter out the dirt from the pure word, the water from the pollution. If you're absorbed with politics, if you're focused in on social causes only, if you're not paying attention to what Jesus is saying to you, you may find yourself standing outside the door. Or in this case, he's standing outside the door and knocking at your heart. He's trying to get your attention because God isn't always going to bless you. No, he's not. God isn't always going to give you abundance. No, he's not. God isn't always going to tell you, oh, you're going to have a wonderful life and there's no thorns in your life. No, he's not. He's going to tell you, I am bringing judgment on the world. I am bringing the challenges that you need to demonstrate that though it be dark, you are children of the light. And though the world and its ways seem to go in one direction, you're not pulled into that quicksand and that quagmire of wanting to be like the world and having you know the amphitheaters and the mega churches and doing all the things the crowds want to do. But you're willing to do what I want you to do. You see, there's a gradual weaning of the body of Christ, the bride of Jesus, from the church at large. Because the church at large is getting ready to accept a false religion. It's getting ready to accept this kind of grace covers everything and we don't need to do anything and that everyone can be saved because after all, grace is how we were saved. And it's going to be this false theology that has come out slowly working its way into Christianity that says because of grace hell is removed. Because of grace no one goes into condemnation. Because of grace everyone will be saved. It's just a question of when. And slowly, perniciously that's beginning to feed its way into the gospel. You know, the gospel of feel good, do good, you know, kind of like even the Christian radio stations have been all about the, you know, encouragement. Oh, we want to encourage you. We want to exhort you. We want you to, you know, feel good, do good, and be good. Well, that's good, is it? Jesus said, call no man good except your Father which is in heaven. Jesus had some very challenging words to say at times to his own disciples. And they had to kind of come to grips with it. So, when we walk in the light as he is in the light and we have fellowship one with another, we have to challenge each other also to look at ourselves as well as have someone look at us and say, you know, that's not right. What you're doing is wrong. You know, you're, you, you know, you're stomping on people. You know, that's not right. You're beating up on the saints. That's not right. You know, 
Now, maybe others do, do that, and maybe you want to leave them alone and let them do what you know they think that God is calling them to do, but I've chosen you to be my disciple. I've chosen you to follow me. I've chosen you to feed my sheep. Would you walk with me? Would you talk with me? Would you take up your cross and follow me? If you would, then I would call you children of the Most High. As we are told in the Sermon on the Mount, that they which did these sayings of Jesus were called children of God. They were called children of God. They weren't called Christians. That was much later that the Roman soldiers and those in Corinth started slamming the way that Christians were dying by calling them little Christs because of the way they died to self and took up their cross and followed Jesus even unto death. That's why they were called Christians. Now it's interesting today, a lot of people call themselves Christians because they go to church. They call themselves Christian because they look good, they feel good, and they act good. You know, like Mormons. They call themselves Christians. So do Jehovah's Witnesses. So do quite a few cults, as I understand, and call themselves Christian. And yet, when you ask them, do you know Jesus? Have you talked to him today? Have you walked in the knowledge of his relationship with you? talking to you as the only begotten Son of God. Have you heard Him speak to you? Today, have you heard His voice? And the reality is, no, they haven't. But you see, that brings up another point, a rather challenging one for all of us. Today, as it says in the provocation, Harden not your heart. And any time that you hear that word, harden not your heart, you ought to be thinking of, you know, Pharaoh, who God was speaking to through Moses, and Pharaoh kept hardening his heart, and Pharaoh hardened his heart against the children of Israel, and didn't listen to what Moses was saying to him, and warning him, and warning him, and then finally God said, I will harden your heart. And so Pharaoh didn't harden his heart in the end, God did. And at that point in time when God hardened Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh wasn't listening anymore. Pharaoh wasn't paying attention. Pharaoh was deadlocked into destruction based upon his own choices because God added the increase. Today, in modern society that we live in, with all the technology and all the voices crying out to us and all the mega ministries and all the opportunities to study, you know, and to get involved and to be a part of some kind of digital church. The question I have to ask you is, even with all these benefits, and God bless the benefits that we've been given in man-made technology, what makes man-made God-inspired is if God is in it. And the question you have to ask yourself is, God in you? The way you know that isn't by faith and just Oh, I believe it, so God's in me. Oh, I, I believe in, you know, the fairy tale, you know, the fairy, the tooth fairy, so God is in me. I believe in, you know, Santa Claus, so Santa's in me. You know, I believe in, you know, horoscopes, so the horoscope is in me. That's almost more true than you know, because in some ways, demonic activity does cause some of those things to happen, and they are harassing you, and maybe in your mind, so to speak. Is Jesus the Son of God who said, I will come to you and I will fellowship with you and I will speak to you and my sheep will hear my voice and you will know me and I will be known of you and you will know my Father that you would not only know me but you would know him who sent me. That's our bottom line. That's where today the rubber meets the road. That's what makes us sons of God as opposed to Christians as the religion is taught. Because the Christian religion is taught that all you need to do is make a profession of faith, you know, and accept the fact that Jesus died for you, and bingo, you get to go to heaven. You know, admit that you're a sinner, you know, and confess your sins, you know, and just kind of like, you know, try to do good after that, you know, and kind of go to church, you know, and do your tithing and pray, you know, and you're okay. You know, that's, that's all you need to do. Nothing more is required of you. 
except for what Jesus said. And that's where we get into a challenging place in Christianity, you know, because the religion sometimes moved onward without the relationship. When Christianity went to the right and decided to be so pure, it started an inquisition and started killing Christians in order to make sure they had the right kind of Christians. You know, kind of like what people do today, murdering each other in the name of God by calling each other not Christian, murdering in the name of Jesus. How do we know the difference between someone who is filled with the Spirit, walking in the Spirit and knows God and is hearing His voice, as opposed to someone who's just kind of like, well, you know, maybe they're religious, but they're not much in their relationship and we need to pray for them. Jesus is the answer. Jesus himself said, By this shall you know you are my disciples indeed. In that you have love for one another. Wait a minute. So are you trying to tell me that love is the answer to how we know we're in him? Well, you see, if according to 1 John, we know we are his if we have love for one another. We know we are his if we love as he loved. According to 1 John, love is the answer. Now John Lennon may have had kind of an idea of where he wanted to go, but he didn't know how to get there, and so he died in despair. But love is the answer if it's God doing the loving through us. Because we can't love of ourselves, obviously, because in five minutes anyone could walk along and tick you off and you quite frankly can't get over it right away sometimes. Now maybe if you've been a Christian a long time and you've been loving people a long time, maybe you can. Maybe you could be provoked pretty far. But as soon as someone puts your loved one in front of you, you know, and says, I'm gonna murder them unless you, you know, do what I say, you don't feel so loving. And yet that's what Jesus did. Jesus had his family there watching him die. Jesus had even his disciples watching him die. And even they fled because they despaired of the faith that this Son of Man, the Son of God, had. That could choose to love his enemies so much that even in dying, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That kind of love is where we're going. That kind of love is what we're becoming. That kind of love can only be done by someone who's living in us as opposed to someone who's influencing outside of us and trying to get in us by knocking at the door of our heart. You see, salvation is an interesting process that we say it's accomplished because of the way God looks at it. But the truth is, as far as our part's concerned, we still have stuff to do. We still have to choose each day whom we will serve, the gods of men or the God that is living and alive. Will we serve the gods of religion or the gods of men? Will we serve religious ideas or will we serve the relationship that we have with Jesus? We can add religion to our relationship, but we can never add anything to religion except a relationship with Jesus because if we don't have that, according to 1 John, we don't have salvation. So you may have a nice religion that makes you look good, that makes you feel good, that makes you act good and wind up in hell. And the way we know that too is because Jesus said it. He said, well, you know, you did prophesy my name and that's good. I like that. You did, you know, kind of like uh, do all these miracles in my name and, you know, I like that too. You know, and you even went out of your way, you know, and you, you, you made these great temples and cathedrals for me, you know, and these great mega churches and, you know what, I like that too. But I don't know you. Wait a minute. So, all that was good, but wasn't good enough. No. You see, in Christianity, it's never been about what you do. It's been about who you know. And while we know about Jesus, the question we have to ask ourselves today, the question we have to challenge ourselves today, the questions we have to learn to deal with every day is, today if we hear his voice, Harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation, because if we're hearing his voice, we'll do his will. If we're not hearing his voice, we'll do our will. And believe me, that's easy for each one of us to do. We have such a strong, self-willed, independent attitude that I know every single Christian can be challenged in certain areas, and they're not going to do God's will. They're going to justify themselves and do their will. 
whether it be about gun controls or gun owning or asserting their freedoms which really what are you trying to assert the fact that you're rebellious because that's what freedom means choosing to be free means you're out from under the authority of God so you can exercise your freedom and that's absolute rebellion according to God now if you're under authority according to Jesus then you are submissive to his will you are submitted to him you are bowing the knee and confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father so this freedom thing is really nice and deceptive but it's really rebellion so today every day we're called chosen and directed to go right back to the Word of God you know the written word but there's something different about the Word of God once you're born again it's not just written but it's called as Jesus was called the Word the Word of God as he is in heaven so when we listen there should be something that makes a connection you know a connection in your heart not in your head a connection that says I said it now you do it and if you don't have that connection either work on it and find out from God what's wrong or you may find out that God has put you aside and the work that needs to be done is you need to find out why you're not saved because salvation is going to be accomplished in you according to his word that he said and today if you hear his voice harden not your heart as says the provocation for he may say to you behold I stand at the door and knock if any man hear my voice and open the door I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me but if he's not spending time with you I don't know where you're going to spend time in eternity but you need to have him spend time with you so you are assured of eternity with him.